uh, over the course of the years I've worked on, uh, on this book and the numerous times uh, and hours and days and weeks that I've spent here, uh, the staff, I just must say, the staff at Fort Ticonderoga has just always been generous, knowledgeable, and helpful. Really a terrific place, not only to work, but Fort Ticonderoga is one of our true national treasures. Uh, there are so few places where you can come and see an 18th century fort, where you can walk in uh, the footsteps of people like Robert Rogers. And uh, I uh, just commend you and I urge you all to support Fort Ticonderoga in any way you can, coming here today, buying books, uh, coming frequently, doing those sorts of things. <clears throat> uh, I am also deeply honored to have worked in the footsteps and coming here. That's another thing that I uh, feel that I, uh, I'm following, as, as Rich mentioned, in the footsteps of John Cuneo. Uh, Kenneth Roberts, Francis Parkman. Um, I can, I've seen their notes. I have read their materials. I feel that I am part of a great grand tradition, that, and I hope that I'm doing justice uh, with this book that I just completed. Uh, they have so eloquently talked about the past and brought these stories alive. This is history at its best. Uh, I've also had the benefit of uh, archival materials that they never have had, they didn't get to see. Um, and you all have a treat in store for you today. Uh, at the end uh, of the presentation, we're going to bring out uh, one of the most primary, important primary source documents that has come out uh, about Robert Rogers that's come out in the last 50 or maybe even 100 years. Uh, very exciting. It's a map. Uh, first time it will have been shown in public that I know of. So uh, uh, that's a treat that you all uh, can look forward to. Uh, two things before I begin. One, I wanted to make a shameless plug for American Heritage Magazine. And uh, if you haven't seen it or know about it, please look it up. It is the preeminent magazine on American history in this country. It tells wonderful, colorful stories uh, about our past. This year, uh, in December, we will be celebrating our 60th anniversary. Bruce Catton was the first editor. Uh, <coughs> David McCullough worked on it. Uh, it's a really terrific thing, so if you haven't seen it, this is another way you can support the wonderful efforts in history out there. And also before I started, too, uh, I wanted to just hold a moment of silence for uh, the men and women who are fighting overseas on our behalf, particularly the Rangers. And now to Robert Rogers, <coughs> the subject of my, bur uh, my, my book. Um, first, I want to see a show of hands. Who has seen the Spencer Tracy movie, Northwest Passage? I can see a few of you. <laughs> I grew up on it, uh, 1940, first Technicolor movie, a really great rollicking tale. Uh, that was one of the ways that really I got into this whole subject. And as you know, that book, is, that movie, uh, is about the St. Francis raid. And we are very privileged to be here, as Rich mentioned, and it happened in the fall 250 years ago and started not far from here. So we're in a really kind of interesting place to kind of take a look at that. So I thought that would, I would talk about that today. Uh, first, who was Robert Rogers? Uh, first, just a, a, uh, a quick, quick note, we have no, there are no portraits of him in real life. So every picture that you see of Robert Rogers is, is uh, an author's imaginative take. Uh, though I particularly like this one um, <clears throat> just because of the, uh, the Indians and the way that it's all set up. And to do this, you'll notice that we cut off the head of him on the front cover of the book. I didn't want to represent that we really did know what he looked like. It adds to the mystery of the man. So who was Ro Robert Rogers? Uh, in a nutshell, a Scots-Irish backwoodsman of New Hampshire uh, who became the most famous figure in the French and Indian War. That, of course, is the battle, uh, the titanic struggle of France and Britain uh, for control um, in North America. Uh, in the beginning of the war, uh, in the mid-1750s, the British had not got the best uh, end of things. The French and their uh, largely their Indian allies um, uh, really took them to task uh, in a number of battles and uh, the British commander Lord Shirley invited the 25 year old 
Rogers to Boston to see what he could learn about woods fighting from this young man. And it's very interesting to think about uh, here the, the supreme commander of um, the British forces and this pretty rough uh, but very talented young man meeting and transferring information. And out of that, Shirley's request that Rogers wrote down 28 rules of engagement. And uh, this is really North America's first war manual. It is uh, uh, a very kind of democratic take on war. It's not the huge, uh, a huge, very complicated set of rules. It's something that any Yankee kind of farmer could learn and remember and take into battle. It's a clever mix of Indian warfare techniques, uh, European tactics, uh, and some, a, a lot gleaned from the long hunter, too but it was his background. So he really started to create something that was very new, very American. And to this day, formation of the Rangers and Special Operations down at Fort Benning, where I spent a little time, they looked to him as the real forefather of the um, invention of, of Special Operations, which, uh, 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 and, 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 and they uh, read him and study him before they go out to Afghanistan and Iraq and elsewhere. Well, on to our story. Um, in September of 1759, Rogers uh, convinced the commander of British forces to launch a bold attack on St. Francis, a Canadian village uh, that had been the source for, uh, of many, many attacks on the colonial British settlements uh, over the years. Uh, the target was some 150 miles to the north through a wilderness uh, with no roads. Uh, and even the idea of a military unit doing something like this had never been contemplated by the British. A dozen miles north of Crown Point, on the eastern shore of Lake Champlain, amid the button brush, bull rush, and cattail wetlands that crowded Otter Creek's sodden delta, Rogers glassed down lake for the Latin sails of a French sloop or schooner. Pulled deep into hiding in the marsh lay 17 whaleboats, each carrying eight long oars and provisions for a month. The expedition, soon to be launched, would undergo perhaps the most grueling ordeal ever recorded in North American history. And in so enduring and surviving, its members would write a new chapter in the roster of special operations. Amherst had finally approved Rogers' long nurtured plan to make a bold and unprecedented strike against St. Francis, 150 miles north as the crow flies, but not as the woodsman labors into Canada. By playing the enemy's own game of woodsman's labors, uh, by playing the enemy's own game of waging fast, surprising, and destructive small unit warfare, Rogers was gambling that he could take the teeth out of the Indians' will to continue their alliance with the French. It was a bold gamble indeed. No British ground expeditionary force during the war had ever contemplated a long-range lunge of such operational scope or strategic intent. As he and his nearly 200 hand-picked men waited patiently, Rogers heard the shrill cry of a bald eagle they watched as it sw swept from its broad nest amid silver maples and green ashes, beating its powerful wings in search of a fat chain pickerel or yellow perch. It was Saturday, September 15th, 1759. The fall weather, already unseasonably cold, had silenced the summer chatter of bullfrog and peeper and brought early frosts that had at least blessedly ki killed off mosquitoes and biting flies. Then Roger's glass disclosed one sloop, then another, sails full, tacking smartly within the lake's close confines. Soon they were joined by a larger schooner. They were not particularly pretty ships. The French had cobbled them together quickly from sails, masts, and fittings that they had stripped from merchant vessels at Quebec. But he could easily see the deadliness of their armaments. The 65-ton sloops mounted swivel guns on their gunnels, and the iron noses of six-pounders protruded from cannon doors. The 70-ton topsail schooner Vigilante bore a brace of brass 12-pounders, as well as a half-dozen iron six-pounders. Had Rogers not pulled his craft inshore, these warships would have made short work of them. In columns on the water, the 17 whaleboats stretched upward of a tenth of a mile in slow parade, easy pickings for an enemy that could top eight knots when and e when even straining and frightened oarsmen found it hard to get whaleboats up to three. A single two-pound ball that bounced over the water could rip a large hole through the planking to wreak havoc among shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder oarsmen 